So let's read now from Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. As Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. What is it in your life that brings you joy? Maybe it's a long list. Maybe it's nothing right now. But what gives you joy? Is it a, is it a spouse? Is it a child? Is it a, a friend, a different relationship? Is it a job? Is it a, an activity? Is it a hobby? Is it a place, a picture, a memory? For some of you, the joy may be in starting. For others, the joy may be in finishing. <laughs> but what is it that brings you joy? Lord willing, the saints of the Lord, known as Black Mountain Baptist Church, bring you joy. For that was the heart of the Apostle Paul every time he thought of the church in Philippi. Thanksgiving and joy. Look at verse 3 of chapter 1. Paul said, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Verse 4, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. So to ask the Apostle Paul, what is it that brings you joy? I'm sure he would have a very, very, very long list. But somewhere on that list would be the church in Philippi. This letter that we know as Philippians is unlike any other letter in the Bible. Most often, the Apostle Paul wrote to correct something, to identify a problem, to address that problem and point to the better way. And sometimes it was a doctrinal problem. Sometimes it was a moral, behavioral, ethical problem. But Philippians is unlike any other letter, for Philippians is a letter of friendship. It's a letter of friendship that does offer some exhortation, some encouragement towards a better unifying way. But as you read through this, you begin to see that this is marked by a different mood, a different tone than so many of Paul's letters. My one sentence summary of the book of Philippians is joyfully strive for unity through humility by and for the gospel. Joyfully strive for unity through humility by and for the gospel. If you don't write it down now, you're going to hear it a bunch over these next 20 some odd sermons that we're going to make our way through the book of Philippians. Why? Be because these themes of joy and unity and humility and the centrality of Christ and his gospel are all through this letter. And my prayer, and I hope it becomes your prayer if it's not already, that joy and unity and humility and Christ-centeredness would only increase in our church family. That when people ask about Black Mountain Baptist Church, we have a smile and we use words like joy and unity, and humility, Christ and his gospel, that's who we are. That's our culture. We know from the book of Acts chapter 16, in particular, beginning in verse 6, all the way through the end, that Paul first preached the gospel in Europe, in the, in the Roman colony of Philippi, around the time of A.D. 50. So about 20 years after the life and death and resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes this letter that we call Philippians about 10 years later as he was uh, sitting in a Roman prison. That he had preached the gospel and it cost him and now he's incarcerated and he's writing this letter back because he hears of news from a guy named uh, uh, Epaphroditus. Um, he comes and brings message about uh, the church in Philippi. Paul then with Timothy as his secretary, as his true child in the faith, as his travel companion, writes this letter back to encourage them to be one. Now, the city or, or the town of Philippi was set up as a, as a special town. It was set up to be a mini Rome. So all of the glories and all of the, all of the cultural uh, 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 blessings of, of the city of Rome were then uh, uh, put into this little colony called Philippi. And it was a special town. It was a, it was a planned town for military veterans and their families. And so uh, the colony was made up of two groups, citizens and strangers. 
And, and the, the citizens, as you can imagine, would be all the government officials that it takes to run this colony, all the military veterans and their families. And everyone else would have been strangers. Most of the strangers were either slaves or farm laborers. Okay? And, and that context matters. And we're going to see it even in, this, in these opening words. But it's going to be, we're going to see it more and more as we make our way through Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. This morning, we're just looking at the first two verses, this word of greeting. And what we see here is a joyful identity. And so I take that because of the, the thrust of this letter. A joyful identity is experienced in being a servant of Christ Jesus, a saint in Christ Jesus, and together with other followers of Christ Jesus. We'll get all this as we walk our way through. A joyful identity is experienced in being a servant of Christ Jesus, a saint in Christ Jesus, together with other followers of Christ Jesus. Most often when we read these letters, we just breeze through the greetings, don't we? The mere formality. But these greetings are inspired of God and profitable. They're profitable for us, and Lord willing, we'll see that. And so the first thing we'll notice is a joyful identity is realized, is experienced as we remember we are a servant. A servant of Christ Jesus. Paul and Timothy, you see right there, verse 1-1. One, one. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. What's, what's worth noting is what's not there. And probably if you read these letters many times, you know what's not there. That is, he does not refer to him, himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's noticeably absent. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus. All of these letters, Paul introduces himself as Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. But that's not what he says right here. Instead, he includes Timothy, again the secretary, as a servant. They are servants of Christ Jesus. Now remember, I said the whole point of this letter is to joyfully strive for unity through humility by and for the gospel. And, and with that in mind, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? That he would not introduce himself with this uh, distinction of authority that he's above these people. But he comes in reasoning with them as a fellow, as a brother, as a partner. And so rather than an apostle, he says, let me tell you the identity that matters right now. I am a servant of Christ Jesus, a bondservant, a slave. And we know that that language now in, in our nation is just so corrupted and twisted, it's hard for us to understand. And we want to uh, take all of this American experience and put it back on what Paul is saying. But no, let's remember, Paul wrote the letter to the church in Philippi long before America was even a thought. He was a slave. Of Christ. He was a bondservant. He was bound to do what Christ had called him, commissioned him, instructed him to do. Another way of saying it, maybe this, this makes sense to you, is he belonged to Jesus. He did not have all the freedoms that we think that we have in Christ. He was a slave of Christ. He belonged to him. And he did what the Lord called him to do. But he does not just do these things. He's not just a servant in word and deed. And that's where so many of us live our lives. And that's why we lack joy. Paul was an apostle who humbled himself now, recognizing he is a servant, not just in word and deed, but in attitude, in humility, in heart posture. The main theme of the book is service to Christ, being a servant of the Lord. Ultimately, it's going to climb to this Christological peak in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, where he tells us, here's an attitude you don't want to have anymore. Here's the new attitude, that is, the attitude of Christ, who himself, though being God, did not count it something to be grasped, but he humbled himself being a servant. And so if the Almighty humbled himself to be a servant, we have to now see being a servant through that lens. That was Paul's ambition for the church in Philippi. That is the Lord's ambition for all of us here today to have this attitude, to have this mindset. It is a joyful thing to serve the Lord. Turn over to Acts chapter 16. I said that's where we find the beginning, the origin of the, the church in Philippi. Acts chapter 16, beginning in, and we're actually going to look at verse 16. So Acts 16, 16. And Paul and, and 
uh, 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 oh goodness, what was his name? Silas. Woo! Lord, thank you for grace. <laughs> and then a, a new believer named Timothy and a new companion named Luke. And they're all on this missionary work and they're trying to continue on the path. But the Lord closes the door on the route that they're on. And he hears this call from Macedonia to come over and preach the gospel. And that was in Philippi. And what we're reading of here is the very first time the good news of Jesus went into Europe. And he went to this little, this little town called Philippi, this Roman colony. You can see that in verse 12. And they remained there some days. And instead of going to the synagogue, which there was not one evidently, they went to this place of prayer, which is along a river. And they saw this woman named Lydia, and she had an interest in this message. And she believed this message. And she said to Paul and the, and the team, stay at my home. Stay at my home. And she persuaded and then we jump in here, verse 16. We're just going to read these two verses. Acts 16, 16. As they were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. And she followed Paul and us crying out. You ready? This is what this little girl, this slave girl said. These men are servants of the Most High God. That's the first public declaration of the identity of the messengers of God in Philippi. And what was it? Servants of the Most High God. And some 10 years later, what did Paul introduce himself as? That founding identity. As I was... Uh, as I was called when I first met you, I still am a servant of Christ Jesus. What that means is Paul didn't graduate from that. He didn't move on from being a servant of Christ Jesus. And I wonder, have you moved on from being a servant? Sure, when you were first converted, you were probably glad just to be used by the Lord. But now, I mean, you've walked with them long enough and you've earned the right to not be a servant, right? Isn't that how our hearts work so often? We want to be called by so many other titles. We want so many other job descriptors over our hearts. You don't graduate from being a servant. For the one you follow has not yet graduated from serving. He's upholding you right now. He's serving you right now. He lives to make intercession for you right now. He's serving you right now. And so whatever that ambition is that lives in us that says, grateful for service, but I'm glad to have this new position. Would you just die to that today? Would you ask the Lord to take that and erase that from your heart and mind to take that desire away? You see, there were other titles that were competing in their hearts. And I've already told you what they were. Citizen and stranger. Those were the two chief identities everybody in this Roman colony would have known themselves to be. Their leading identity was either citizen or stranger. And so Paul is modeling for them right here in, in Philippians 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, he's modeling for them a, a better, a truer identity than being a servant, or, or excuse me, than being a citizen or a stranger. What on earth could be better than being a citizen? Oh, I would love to ask every single one of us that question, one to one. Where we had to drink some truth serum and we couldn't lie. <laughs> what would be better than being a citizen? You know the answer. A servant of Christ Jesus is better than being a citizen. And 2020 is just a pressure cooker, isn't it? It's like that the temperature of our nation has skyrocketed, it's spiked, and we're sick. And we have sides screaming at each other about rights. And meanwhile, the church just seems to be either silent or has joined in that argument. Brothers, Sisters, beloved in Christ, what I'm saying is there's something better 
than citizenship. And he's going to say this in chapter 3 when he says, Our citizenship, that is us, our citizenship is in heaven. That makes us servants. Servants. And let's, let's beat that drum. Let's champion that message. Servants of Christ Jesus. Listen, it's all about Jesus. <laughs> in particular, this letter to the church in Philippi. But in general, everything. <laughs> it's all about Jesus. So I want to ask you, are you aware everybody is a servant? Everybody is a servant of someone or something. None of us gets to check that box. I've already served. I've moved on. We may deny it, but it's still true. We're serving someone. We're serving something. We're serving sin. We're serving ourselves. We're serving all sorts of things. So we should not ask, am I a servant? We should ask, Lord, whom am I serving? What am I serving? And because all things are found in Christ, because we exist in him, of him, by him, and for him, our whole worldview has to be Christ-centered service. I exist, we exist in Christ, by Christ, for Christ. And that's what Paul is, is, is reminding this church in Philippi, that Christ is the foundation of their existence. And brothers and sisters, he is the foundation of our existence. It's why there is a thing called Black Mountain Baptist Church, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the focus of their message. He is the content of their message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is our story, isn't he? He is what unites us. He is what makes us one new creation. He makes us a family. We're not family based primarily on geography, based on stage of life, based on worldly interest. We're a family because of the blood of Jesus. And it's racing all through us now. And it's covered us and cleansed us now. That is who we are in Christ Jesus. My word, even here, he gets credit to be the source of grace and peace. Grace to you from uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, putting them on par with each other. And he is the one that one day every knee will bow to. And every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is everything. In him. By him. For him. We exist. He is the center of our fellowship. Our partnership. Please don't let Jesus ever grow boring to your heart. And please don't ever get tired of hearing these truths again and again and again. So, so I hope you know, I don't have new things to say. I've got an old message to say. And when you walk in here, and I mean this with all the sincerity, with it all figured out, Living in such a way that you don't need to be reminded of who Jesus is and how great his love and grace is. I will resign because you won't need me anymore. <laughs> but until that day, you know what I'm going to say next Sunday? Jesus is everything. Trust him. Jesus is dear. Lean on him. Jesus is glorious. Hide in him. And that will be the message every day until we see him and finally rest from our labors. We belong to him. We look to him. We long for him. I'll ask again, are you okay with going to heaven if Jesus isn't there? God forbid. I don't know where Jesus is going to be. That's where I want to be though. But it's not just in heaven, it's now. And if Jesus is bent over washing the feet of someone, join him because it's glorious. And if Jesus is walking across the street to pray for someone, join him because it's glorious. And if Jesus is up here cleaning a toilet, join him 
Because we're servants of Him. And because we all serve someone or something, we need to be reminded only Jesus is a good and wonderful master. Only Jesus is a wonderful master. Every other master that we will pledge loyalty to is miserable. Give it enough time. Is selfish and will lead to our sorrow and ruin. Oh, ask yourself this. Is there anything Jesus is calling you to be? God is calling us in Christ to be something. Not primarily do something. When we have the being in Christ settled, we'll do well. But if we, if we bypass do, or if we bypass be to do, we'll be miserable. What is God calling you to be? Child, forgiven, righteous. Yes, He's called you to do righteous things because He's called you to be righteous, and you are. Which leads to the second identity. Not only are we servants of Christ, we are saints in Christ. God, this is so good. And I am not sufficient to articulate all that this means here. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Now, saints is not a team in New Orleans. It's not some class of super Christians that live this exemplary life and at their death they get this saint title. Saint is every follower of Jesus. A saint is a holy one. And we're in Christ Jesus. So don't believe the world, maybe even your own heart, when it says if you try a little harder, then you will have measured up to being a saint. Now you are a saint. Be. You are a saint already. So it's not attained through effort and progress and personal holiness. One is a saint. Do you see it with your translation right there? What comes in between the words saint and Christ in your Bible? And if it says anything other than saint, you need to take that back to the publisher and get a refund. I mean, if it says anything other than in, take it back and get a refund. (laughs) You're already a saint in him. That is, Jesus is the one that's responsible for his people becoming, being declared holy, righteous, saints. And the crucified and risen one, he's the definer of our identity. And listen, the identity is in Christ. The identity is in Christ. And he's holy, right? And a hush came over the church. He's holy, right? And we're hidden in him. He died for us. He forgave us. Adopted us into him. What does that make our identity? If he is holy and we're hidden in him? Holy already. And so Paul is saying, I'm not going to call you by what you do. I'm going to call you by who you already are. And there's a whole world system, a whole value system, and it permeates the church. And it goes like this. What you do is who you are. And that's true apart from Jesus. What you do is who you are. But when you've repented and trusted in Jesus, what he did is who you are. Did you hear me? What he did is who you are. Now, I know I'm belaboring the point because I long for this to click in our hearts and our minds. We're free. He's not telling you try harder, do better, measure up, then you'll have peace. He is our peace. He is our righteousness. You'll never do enough to give you peace. He's done it all. Receive it. Can you believe today, functionally, experientially, can you believe today you are a saint, a holy one, in Christ Jesus, finished? You remember there on the cross, he shouted, it is finished. That is everything God demanded of his covenant people. It is finished. So he's not saying try harder to prove anything. 
He's saying, die and receive. Trust in Him. Hide in Him. You see, this identity of saint in Christ Jesus is a great door of God's grace that the Lord Jesus kicked wide open for all who will humble themselves and follow Him. Did you hear me? Standing before every one of us right now is this door of grace. But in order to pass through that door of grace, you have to let go of ego. You have to let go of this this sometimes suffocating ambition of self-worth and self-value. And you have to be an acknowledger of reality. You tried and you failed. And you tried and you failed. And that door of grace is right there before you. And he says, come on through. I did it for you. Receive it. And so if you'll repent and trust in him, the Lord is offering to all of us here peace today. And it's only through this this identity of saint that we'll actually treat each other with respect as fellow image bearers. It's only as we embrace this identity of already a saint in Christ that we will actually love and respect, that we will strive for unity through humility by and for the gospel. Otherwise, we're going to keep saying, but I have accomplished and you haven't, so therefore I'm entitled to feel hurt by you right now. Or I tried and I put forth my effort and I failed because you didn't come through on your end. And that's why we're separate. But when we all pass through that door of grace together, we will begin, we will enter into joyfully striving for unity through humility by and for the gospel. So please don't believe, please don't believe our gospel message. The scriptures are saying to you, you too can be a saint. Try harder. You're a saint in your effort. Because that's the internal gospel that we will preach many, many times. A saint in your strength, a saint in your ability. How about this one? In your ability to forgive yourself. I am, I am just bone tired of hearing Christians say, I know God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. I heard it just this week. That's why it's on my heart and mind. And that, that one has placed himself, herself over God. I thank you for your forgiveness, but I can't forgive myself. I know better. You're not a saint if you learn to forgive yourself. You're not a saint in your maturity. Not a saint in trying to get it together, being, uh, attaining a certain spiritual rank. You're not even a saint in being humble. You're a saint in Christ Jesus. It is finished. So when that identity becomes your identity, burdens have fallen off. Peace becomes your experience and therefore joy rises in your heart. But these aren't meant to be uh, uh, celebrated or benefited in in isolation. Uh, These are to be the identities that we celebrate together. Because this letter is about fellowship. It's about partnership in the gospel. And that's why then in this third uh, portion here, this joyful identity of servant and saint is most truly experienced when we're in this together, together with other followers of Christ Jesus. So he says to all the saints, not to the saint, not to you, Christ saint, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. This is fantastic. This word from the Lord is for all the saints at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. And so uh, at first reading, you know what's most startling in in my estimation, what's most startling about this word of greeting? It's not what's missing an apostle of Christ Jesus. What's startling is that phrase with the overseers and the deacons. That surprises me. And it surprises me because it's the only letter that Paul wrote that has that inclusion. Everything else is to the church or to Timothy or to Titus. But here he says to the church with the overseers, that is pastors, with the overseers and the deacons. Why would he include that? Why mention pastors and deacons? Doesn't that create classes and ultimately distinctions which leads to divisions? Isn't that what he's writing against? No, not really. Because most believe the division in the church was because of pastors and deacons. And I know we could never fathom such a thing ever existing. Can we, Bob? In case you don't know, Bob, our former pastor, is with us today. 
Most believe the pastors and the deacons were the reason the church in Philippi just couldn't pull it together. This just got awkward. Somehow they played a role in the lack of unity. That is, the two offices God gave the church for the benefit of the church, for the prosperity of the church, for the unity of the church, had now begun somehow to be used by the enemy to separate this church. We see the origin of deacon ministry all the way back in the book of Acts chapter 6. And the whole reason they were given, deacons were given to the early church was because of disunity. They lacked unity. And so, so the apostles were busy in all the preaching and teaching. That is, the apostles, as they died, you, we were left with elders and pastors in local churches. So we see a pattern there in Acts chapter 6. You had one group of, of men that were set aside by God to preach and to pray. And, and in the rapid expansion of the church there, as they were preaching and praying, what it led to was neglect, overlook. There were widows in the church that were not being fed. There were divisions in the church based on ethnicity, based on some, some cultural distinctions. And so the apostles knew... We can't stop preaching and praying. And God inspired them to say, uh, basically, uh, pick out a group of men that are godly in character and they will be used precisely to foster unity in the church. And so as these godly men were identified, they began to serve these widows and serve the tables. And what happened was all of the rumbling, all the grumbling, all the division began to quiet down. And this is why, and I mean this, this is why many people have said through the years, deacons are to be like mufflers on a car. I'll say it again, deacons, you are to be like a muffler on a car. What happens when somebody takes the muffler off their car? You hear them coming from a mile away, don't you? It's loud. But you put the muffler on the car, it muffles it, it quiets it down. Deacons are like mufflers. When functioning in their God-ordained role, they're the active peacemakers and unifiers of the church. Not the dividers. Not the, this is my ministry. No. It's looking out to the interest of others. It's, it's ensuring that everyone is on the same page. It really is a death to self to unite the people of God. And the church in Philippi had evidently begun to drift into other categories instead of one people of God. They'd begun to drift back into those two categories of citizens and strangers. You see, the, the pull, the gravitational pull of this world is towards division. You know that? Because we are made in the image of God. And by the way, God is three in one, three persons, one God. That's why we would say triunity or trinity. And we're made in the image of God. We're made to be one, unity in diversity. But the world and the flesh and the devil are always trying to pull us apart. They're always trying to separate us. They're always trying to, to get us to adopt a new identity. And what we need to remember is this ain't about us. It's about him. And he, the one who came, laid down his life not to save an individual and not to save a world full of individuals, but to save a people, a family, a nation, a community, a church, a body. And so the work of the Spirit is always moving us towards unity. It's always moving us towards death to self so that we can be together as one. And the church in Philippi had missed this, uh, though, they are, uh, though they recognize they are saints in Christ Jesus. They were pulled apart by their immediate culture. What they forgot and what we forget is that when we're born again, when we're saved in Christ, cleansed by the blood of Jesus, covered with the righteousness of Christ, we no longer belong to our immediate culture. So their chief identity was not Greco-Roman anymore. It was Christ. I want to ask you, and you can write this down, and we can converse about it later. Are you a Christian, a Christ follower, that just happens by the sheer providential mercy of God to be an American? Or are you an American that just happens to be a Christian? Both of those cannot be equal in our hearts and minds. For the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 6, we cannot serve two masters. Which identity governs you? Were you saved out of this culture into a new culture? Out of this community into a new community? If Christ is your Lord, the answer is yes. If our citizenship is in heaven, 
Our partnership is in Christ. And he gave us new ambitions that surpass a spot of land. That surpass even this whole world. He gave us new identities as his family. And what we share in Christ transcends all that this world can offer us. Life interests, demographics, politics, citizenship. What we share in Christ surpasses all of those. And is eternal. And even though every, even though every kingdom of this world will pass, Christ's kingdom is forever. And even though our citizenship here is temporary and we love it, it's temporary. And our citizenship in Christ is forever. And I think one of the downfalls of the American church, while the American church took off like a, like a rocket and it was, it was spectacular for so many ages, one of the downfalls was that individual uh, ambition that so many in our culture live by. And so many have a have this uh, 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 me and Jesus type of relationship. And when they read the Bible, they somehow don't notice these letters are written to churches. They somehow don't remember that God formed a nation as a picture of his church. And we make it all about ourselves. So few of us realize the centrality of the local church in the will of God. Let's remember, if you are truly with Christ, he's the head of the body, the church, and he didn't divorce himself from his body. And so if you're truly with Christ, you'll be identified with a local assembly of Christ's followers, a family. You won't just date her, keep her around when she benefits you. You will marry her. And serve her. For that is the will of God for his people. That's what he shed his blood for. So I think so. Uh, one of the reasons so many American Christians are, are just so pessimistic or discouraged or condescending or critical. And I could go on and on. But one of them is like depressed or sad or angry. So many American Christians have severed themselves from the body of Christ. They're all about being a servant. They're all about being a saint. But this whole together with other followers of Jesus is just a bridge too far. And no wonder we're so moody. Because we're trying to do it on our own. And he's not called any one of us to do it on our own. He's called us to do it together as a family. And coronavirus didn't make it happen. Coronavirus just compounded the problem. But it's been there for generations. So what I'm saying is it's not God's will for any of us to embrace these joyful identities in isolation. Rather, we are to embrace these joyful identities together in fellowship as servants of the Lord, looking not to our own interests, but to the interest, to the benefit of others. So please, whatever those secret conversations that, you, that go on in your heart and your mind, please don't believe it's okay to stay home. You can watch on TV. No, this is a moment. This is a moment in history where the church has, has, has experienced a spiritual injury and some have to stay home right now. But let's not accept that as that's now the new normal. Let's grieve that and let's pray for the Lord to bring us back together, not just for Lord's Day worship, a Sunday morning gathering, but for day after day after day, fellowship and mutual service together. It's not his will to stay home. But he did give us a crutch with this technology right now to get us through this season until we have our legs under us and we're healthy again. And so don't hear me as if you're staying home, you're sinning against God. That's not what I'm saying right now. But it may be true. God knows your heart. God knows that we have some in our church that would give their right arm to be with us today. But their children or their spouse or whomever just can't have it. And they have to stay home. The Lord bless them and keep them, right? We agree with that? But to those that have grown lazy, God forbid. To those that see the convenience, it's so much easier to stay on my couch. We pray God change their heart because we need them and we miss them. And we've put a mask on to be here and that's like a functional death to self in some way. It's so doggone, it's so frustrating. But we've done it for the glory of God and the good of others. And let's pray that over the coming weeks, more and more, we'll sense that calling of the Lord.
to do likewise. So don't give in to doing this on your own, to withdrawal, to isolation. Rather, strive for unity through humility by and for the gospel. So listen, God's will is a church, okay? And if you think the church is going too slow, brother, sister, be patient and help us speed up. Don't write us off and move on without us. And brother, sister, if you think we're going too fast, be patient with us and help us slow down. Don't write us off and move on without us or stay put without us. Be patient. And let's strive together to be one body, one.